Welcome to Digital Asset News. Take a top stories in crypto and bring them out of bite-sized pieces. Today, instead of talking about the news, what I want to do is really dig into uh, the lawsuit, uh, the Chapter 11 bankruptcy with Celsius and to a lesser extent with Voyager. And there's a couple of questions that have come up, actually many questions from a lot of the viewers from the last videos that we've done. And what I did was I reached out uh, to some contacts just to get some information and to experts who could help me answer a bunch of these questions. And it came back uh, McConnell and Valdez, one of the largest and oldest uh, law firms in Puerto Rico. Uh, they also have branches in uh, Miami and New York. And I got an expert and his name is Najuan Zorabani, Trinidad. And he is a bankruptcy uh, expert, uh, lawyer, and he's been doing this for 15 years. And what I did is I sat down with him and asked him some, some basic questions about the reorganizations. What exactly is Chapter 11? How does that differ from different bankruptcy? Where things are going? How this is going to uh, affect uh, regulation and more? So uh, without further ado, let's jump in and talk to uh, Najwan. And before we go on, just so you know, this is not legal advice. So please consult uh, with your own lawyer. So let's jump in. All right, everybody. So as promised, I brought somebody in here who could really shed some light on exactly what's going on in these proceedings. Now, this is just a, a general overview of uh, bankruptcy because I am not a lawyer. So again, I brought uh, Najwan in to uh, tell us exactly what it is. Najwan, thanks again for stopping by. This is going to help a lot of people just understand the process. Oh, thank you for the invitation. Happy to be here. Yeah, this is going to be good. This is going to be good because I can only tell them so much in my layman's terms. So I got four questions for you. And it's going to go, go from this. First of all, what's bankruptcy? How you define that? And what are the different chapters in bankruptcy? The next one is, let's go over these first day proceedings for the Celsius and just really break it down. There's a couple of key questions that I tried to answer, but I need uh, somebody who's more of a professional like yourself. Next up, what makes a chapter 11 successful in your experience? Because you are going through a lot of those in, in your law firm right now. That's what you do. And then lastly, how does this case transfer to general crypto regulation? I think as time moves forward, we're going to take a look and say, well, this could actually set precedent, especially with the proceedings that are going on right now. So my man, first one, what is bankruptcy? And define the different chapters in such bankruptcy so we can actually understand and move forward. Sure, no problem. So no. bankruptcy, first of all, is a legal protection. It's a statute, on, it's one of the federal statutes called the Bankruptcy Code. Uh, okay. So the concept of bankruptcy is fairly simple. The first one is it allows a debtor. The debtor is, you know, basically the one who has okay. all the debt, cannot pay it out. It's insolvent. It allows them on, an opportunity to pay their debt and get out and get a fresh start. Uh -huh. At the same time, it has a dual purpose. It, allow, it allows creditors an organized fashion mm -hmm. in order to collect and puts them in priorities and in list to collect. So it avoids a run to the courthouse so that the debtor can operate. So in a nutshell, that essentially is what bankruptcy uh, is. So, okay. And then we, we talk about the chapters. People hear about the concept of chapters. Yeah. So the bankruptcy code is divided into different chapters. So mm -hmm. that's the reason why you have chapters. But the main ones are, and we hear chapter seven. Chapter seven bankruptcy, it's a liquidation. It's usually mm -hmm. an asset-based bankruptcy where you take the debtor's assets and you pay out the creditors as much as you can until you shut it down. Okay. The next that you have is a chapter nine that does not apply here, which is a municipal bankruptcy. I'm involved in a case, pre, which is basically a chapter nine currently. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Then you have a chapter 11, which is what we have here with the Celsius bankruptcy, as well as with Voyager. Chapter yeah. 11 is a reorganization. The, it's mostly used by corporate or commercial debtors, even mm -hmm. individual, maybe high net worth individuals uh, who could file to chapter 11. It's a more complex process. The idea of a Chapter 11 bankruptcy is you get a plan of reorganization that ultimately gets confirmed and you pay everyone out. Does not mean you pay everyone 100%, but ah. you pay them what they're entitled to under the bankruptcy code. And those are the main ones that you'll see. You have others such as Chapter 12, which is for family fishermen, Chapter 13, which is individual bankruptcy reorganizations, and Chapter 15, which coincidentally is what in three hours capital is. And mm -hmm. that is a multi-jurisdictional bankruptcy. It's essentially a foreign bankruptcy that you could file in the United States. 
Gotcha. So that one seems a heck of a lot complex. We'll let, we'll let three O's capital deal with that. So chapter yeah. 11 reorganization, not liquidation. We're mm -hmm. trying to get us some kind of consensus and move ourselves forward. So let's break it down a little bit further. So let's talk about the first day proceedings and really go over some, some of the different statements that were put forth by council, which I didn't really understand perfectly. So that's why I'm glad you're here. So this is the first day of proceedings. Again, if you want to find this, there's a link in the description. You can find it yourself. This is exactly what was presented to the judge. And here's the big questions that came up, the key legal questions. Let's just go over the first one by the numbers. Number one, are the crypto assets in Celsius possession property of the estate? Is the answer to this question different for crypto assets held under the custody versus the earned program? It's uh, a loaded question. And what about crypto assets transferred to Celsius to collateralize institutional and retail loans? So really, this is like a three for one type of question. So, Najwan, what do you think about this one? Yeah. So this one is going to be a very interesting question. <laughs> and, and by the way, these bankruptcies, it's important to understand, they are cases of first impression on uh, many of the crypto industries right. and these type of uh, crypto institutions which you would deposit and transfer your wallets and your crypto into it. So this is really going to set a precedence of what's going to happen going forward. Okay. So let's take that first question. A couple of key, in order to answer the first question, which is the crypto assets in Celsius possession property of the estate. It's important to understand a concept. Property of the estate, once a debtor such as Celsius files for bankruptcy, you have to define what the estate estate is. It's essentially all of the assets that the debtor has as of the petition date. Petition date being the date they file for bankruptcy. That's when the estate is created. Mm -hmm. So you take all of the assets, legal and equitable, and you put them in their property of the estate. So another key component, it's not there. It's important to understand. It's what's a creditor. A right. creditor is any person or entity who is owed money by the debtor by Celsius in this case, or who have a claim against Celsius that will ultimately be paid out in, you know, in money or some sort of payment. Mm -hmm. So going back, so the first question, the reason why it's a bit loaded, are the crypto assets property of the estate? This is an excellent question because Celsius and their counsel, similar mm -hmm. as has happened with Voyager, have taken the position that when customers transfer their crypto wallets, into their platforms, that the platform itself, Celsius or Voyager, mm -hmm. is now the owner of that crypto because of the terms of use, uh, which indicates that you know they'll be the owners of it. And they're now taking the position that the customers who deposited or who transferred that crypto into the platforms are now creditors because to the extent that Celsius is now the owner and you lent it to them, you're the equivalent of a bank collecting on a loan. Right. So that is a position council is taking. Now, let's head on over to the second question. Oh, okay. because, so, so, yeah, sorry, sure. so, so before we go on, there's going to be people screaming at the screen right now. And they're going to be saying, but that's not was told to me in these AMAs, in the different proceedings, and the different tweets and things like that. In the terms of service, yes, we, we went over that and it just clearly states you, we, if you give us the cryptocurrency, that is a property of ours. We do with it as we see fit. But as it was put out, it didn't seem like that's the way it was. Can you speak on that? Can you talk to, to that? And then how does that work? Because if it's in the terms of service, well, it's in terms of service, even though it was misrepresented uh, outside. So it, it's an important point to understand. Mm -hmm. First things first. Yes, it's in the terms of service. And there has been a lot of representations. Mm -hmm. But the important factor before we start talking about this, bear in mind that this presentation that we're talking about was put out by Celsius and Celsius Council. Mm -hmm. They are not the customer's council. They represent the interest of Celsius. So the position that Celsius is taking is that these cryptos that have been transferred into the platform now belong to Celsius. If that is what the court ultimately decides, that's a big question mark. We do not mm -hmm. know. And it goes back to the same points that you were bringing, Rob, which is the issue is there have been representations, different representations, different marketing materials. Celsius at one point represented that it's banking for the unbankable. 
right. and you transfer your crypto, you earn rewards, you could get take loans against it. So it, it gave the impression that you were the owner. You know, the terms of you sure. say one thing, but if ultimately the court finds that this is, is it Celsius crypto or is it the customer's crypto? And that also leads to another swath of questions that trickle down from there, such as what type of asset is this? Who is the owner of it? Who is mm -hmm. the holder? Is it in possession? So these are big questions mm -hmm. that the court needs to take into account and the court needs to answer in order to move this case forward. Gotcha. So it, it makes sense. There's a good thing that you, you said. There's a, there's a dichotomy here between who the council is for. It's for Celsius. It's not for uh, the debtors, the creditors, and things like that. Okay, so that'll be the first part. Sorry to interrupt you. So for the second part, sure. is the answer to the question different for crypto assets? Correct. So this is going to be very important. And this dovetails from the first question. If these are assets are in the possession of Celsius, mm -hmm. so does that change if it's in the custody or the earned program? So uh, Celsius is posing this question and they're working off of the terms of use mm -hmm. you know, for your viewers, you know, kind of refresh their memory back in April 15, 2022, Celsius changed their terms of use in terms mm -hmm. of what happens with the earned program, the crypto that's in the earned program versus the custody program. There's language in the terms of use as of April that crypto in the earned program belongs to Celsius. Now, does how does that language contrast to what has been marketed to cons to consumers from the fir first day in Celsius, right? right? And what the court will rule on whether this terms of use trumps the other circumstances with regard to who the owner of the crypto is. This is a huge inquiry that needs to be answered. And, and like I mentioned, it's a threshold question to move this case forward, or in fact, how this case will move forward. Gotcha. Okay, so that takes care of, of that piece right there. But then, <clears throat> let, me, let me come back here. So then the last piece, which was, and I don't know if we've gone over this per se, where it talks about, what about crypto assets transferred to Celsius to collateralize institutional and retail loans? So th this is interesting. According to the terms of use, if you took out a loan, the, the crypto would be moved, if I'm not mistaken, into the earned program. I don't recall if it was the earned or the custody. Long story short, it would be in Celsius's possession. And, and in fact, an important point is that I think the, the differentiating factor I'm trying to make is that if it's in the earned program, it's Celsius's property, I right. believe. That's where they're going. If it's in the custody program, it's a big question mark on whether they're holding it in bailment or they're holding it in, in, in custody for the benefit of the, the, the consumer, in which case the, the consumer would be the owner of the crypto. Right. If you took out a loan, the, where the crypto was being kept was transferred. So if it's now in Celsius's, uh, well, let's say, purview, Mm -hmm. They might try to make the argument that those collateralized crypto against uh, the margin loan, so to speak, uh, is now the property of Celsius. Again, all of this, bear in mind, this was put out by Celsius Council. This is Celsius's presentation to the wor world and their view of the world of where things stand or how it should go forward. If that right. holds in court is a different question altogether. It's a you know, it might be a different reality. Yeah. And you know what, just what you said, it made me think though, just what you said, if the council is there for Celsius, the in, it would behoove Celsius to actually say, well, you give us the, that collateral, because if you're a retail investor like myself, you have to 2X, 3X or 4X what you were actually taking out. And if that's the case, and they want to say, well, let's keep 2X or 3X, that's a pretty good deal for Celsius. Not saying that is what is going on, but I could see where they would make the argument. It makes a lot of sense. Okay. So from there, Let's break down these next three, because I think they're all kind of uh, in conjunction with each other. What does it mean to unimpair a crypto claim or to pay a crypto in full? Are customers entitled to the return of a crypto in kind? And the amount of crypto claim is determined as to what date, what date, what time, distribution date, and everything else. How does that all three come together? 
Okay. It is, this is very important to, under, to explain. I indicated previously that the purpose of a Chapter 11 uh, bankruptcy is you have a plan of reorganization. Right. You, in that plan of reorganization, you classify creditors. Uh, you have them into different groups. They vote in favor or against the plan. And the bankruptcy code requires that you provide treatment to those creditors in a certain manner. The concept here that they're talking about is impairing or unimpairing. Mm. Uh, the, that concept, what it means is if you're, let's say, a typical creditor, let's say I have a loan with you mm. and the terms of the loan say you'll pay me back 100% with three, $100,000 with 3% interest. If you honor those terms to the mm. T, my claim is unimpaired. It means I have, and it means I'll collect in full. Will not have a problem. However, depending on the type of creditor you are, you might collect just cents on the dollar, twenty cents, thirty cents. I'm just throwing numbers out there. I'm sure, not saying sure, sure. Not money. saying it is, yeah, correct. So if, in those cases, you're being impaired because you're not collecting in full, and you're not collecting under the original terms of the agreement. Gotcha. So going back to this question, mm -hmm. what does it mean to impair or unimpair a crypto? This is another of those, you know, first impression matters that a bankruptcy judge will have to define with regards to crypto and bankruptcy. When you're a creditor, you typically, when you fill out a proof of claim, and I believe it, you put out a video showing the form, right? And you state the amount of the debt and right. whether you're a creditor and what is a, the basis and the nature of your debt, and you file it, etc. That proof of claim is important because that will entitle you to get your foot in the door to collect under the plan. There's a bar date. You don't file a proof of claim by that date, you're out. Can't You can't collect, right? Uh. Assuming you're a creditor. So let's, let's assume the position that Celsius is taking. They're saying mm -hmm. that all the consumers who deposited in there, the million plus, uh, they're all creditors, right? Mm -hmm. That's a position. Whether the court holds that, it's a different story altogether. Then all of them would need to file a proof of claim. And they need to say, okay, fine. I, let's assume that I had 20 Bitcoin and I didn't take out a loan. I don't have any USDC. I just had 20 Bitcoin at the mm -hmm. moment Celsius filed for bankruptcy. I, they're saying I'm a creditor, right? Because they're saying that I loaned them the crypto. I need to file a proof of claim. What's the amount of my claim? So remember, Bitcoin right. is not a stable coin. It's not tied. It's not pegged. To a particular currency or some commodity, which you know the value of. Crypto ebbs and flows in terms of USDC value. Mm -hmm. Let's say that at the time of the bankruptcy filing, that Bitcoin was worth $20,000, mm -hmm. but it's today, now it's worth $18,000. So going back to the concept of impairment, if they pay me $18,000 when at the time of bankruptcy it was worth $20,000, Am I being impaired or is that just an operation of the market flow of the value in USDC? Another question is, and, and it, it, it goes in part of that same presentation. Does that mean instead of paying me $20,000 or 18, do they just pay me back with, you had one Bitcoin with one Bitcoin. Is that the equivalent of being impaired or unimpaired? These are all uh, you know, legal conundrums that a bankruptcy judge for the first time has to analyze. Usually right. in bankruptcies, a chapter 11 bankruptcies, chapter nine bankruptcies, specifically a title three in PROMESA, mm -hmm. where I represent a two billion plus creditor for years now. Yeah, uh, it, it's in dollars. It's in USDC. They may have bonds. They may have other type of property. But at the end of the day, you value it all in USDC. Crypto has the ability of it being valued one Bitcoin. Or do I need to value it in USDC? Right. And you know what? This now I remember. So when you were talking about the, the file of claim, so we took a look at this on our last video. And again, there's a link in the description that you can find this Stretto. But on the very top, case info court docket, case management, file a claim. If you click on file a claim, it'll take you here to an electronic claims filing. And when you click on that, it'll ask you for a password. But all you have to do is request the password. They'll send it to you in your email and you'll get it and you'll be able to actually fill this form out. When we filled this form out, I thought it was very odd because it asked for a dollar amount. And people ask me the same question, like, well, what's a dollar amount? Well, you know, what, like, is it now? Is it in the future? Is it in the middle? So the, so the question is, because this is so ambiguous, if they're asking for a dollar amount, just between, and of course, 
but you, you don't have to answer this, but me personally, if I had to figure out a dollar amount, I would probably pick the dollar amount for that Bitcoin at its highest point, maybe not its lowest point, and then go from there. And that is, that is to say, if they even do dollar amounts, because as I remember, one Bitcoin is still one Bitcoin. I would rather have my one or 10 or 20 Bitcoin back than the dollar amount. That kind of defeats the whole purpose of, whole, uh, of all investing. So now it makes a lot of sense what you just said, because I think it's the mentality of how things are usually done, but that's not the case. And there's a lot of new nuances in this one, for sure. Yeah, it's a brave new world yeah. with bankruptcy and crypto. When the code was written, the rules, the forms, all the regulation, no, no one had envisioned a concept of a Bitcoin or a crypto as a payment in kind or legal tender as opposed to the U.S. dollar, which right. you would value the claim or is how you would get paid. Now, you could get paid with bonds, et cetera. Maybe you could get a substitute. I've, that has happened in Chapter 11 complex cases. You might get a substitute stock, substitute bond. Maybe that would be the most equivalent. But it all depends on whether the parties are willing to go that route. The typical rule of thumb is there's some sort of legal tender, some sort of currency to pay your creditor. The bankruptcy code was not written for this, and it hasn't been updated. We don't know if it's going to be updated anytime soon. <laughs> um, but but th that's why these cases are so important. It's a brave new world. We're entering into new territory, and it's going to be up to the bankruptcy judges in the Celsius case, in the Voyager case, to start defining the rules and limitations and how these things are going to move forward. Perfect. You know what? That would lead me to the question number four, which we'll get to in a second, is how this will actually... Uh, how this case will transfer to general crypto regulation to set precedent. But before we get into that, let's talk about this last one. This is the one that I got the most pushback and question about, which was number four here. Can Celsius recover customer withdrawals or loan liquidations completed in the 90 days before filing as preferences? Meaning, can they claw this all back? That was a big shocker to me, but what do you say here? Okay, so a couple of key concepts, which is very important. I know you mentioned it in, in, your, in your video, which is, can they do that? So there's a section in the bankruptcy code that allows for the clawback of certain payments that are made to creditors within the, the 90 day period before the filing of the bankruptcy. Now, this is mm -hmm. what's called a preference. Mm -hmm. And the concept of the preference is, it, there's a presumption that within 90 days before the bankruptcy filing, the debtor was insolvent. Right. And wh what they're trying to avoid is a situation where the debtor, knowing that it's insolvent, is going to say, listen, I have 100 creditors. Uh, I don't have enough money to go around, but these three, I like them. So I'm going to pay them in full 90 days before filing for bankruptcy. And what mm. the preference concepts looks into is whether this creditor, it's in the, it's in the title, was preferred mm. by the debtor to the detriment of the other creditors, right? Uh, it was preferred by the debtor, I'm sorry, to the detriment of other creditors. And that's why it has this clawback powers to bring the money back so they could distribute all of the creditors evenly. The, the, the idea behind a preference is that that creditor cannot collect more than it usually would have in the bankruptcy, mm. okay? So that's what the 90 days and the clawback means. Now let's transfer that to Celsius. So the position that Celsius and their counsel are taking is that if I'm a customer who deposited my crypto in the platform, they're saying that I lent it to them. Right. I became a lender. They are a debtor and I'm a creditor. Right. So to the extent that I withdrew or made transfers within 90 days, I collected on my quote unquote debt. And ergo, I fall within the scope of a preference. Mm. Okay. okay. So th this opens up another can of worms, which the preference litigation is very common in, mm. in chapter 11 cases. It's filed as a separate, basically like a complaint under the bankruptcy. Right. You have different defenses. That The reason I say this opens a separate can of worms is this forces a separate question. I know you and I discussed about this previously, mm. which is, okay, fine, to understand whether there's a preference or there isn't a preference, we need to understand a basic question. What is crypto? In the eyes of the bankruptcy, what is crypto? Is it stocks? Is it a commodity? Is it a currency? 
Is it a general intangible? Is it a bailment? I'm throwing a lot of legal concepts. I'm not going to go through each and one of them. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you why that question is important. For example, under the bankruptcy code, if it's considered a currency or could be considered a a currency, there are protections in the bankruptcy code that would not allow the preference to go forward, potentially. Hmm. We'd have to look into it, especially if they treat it as a swap agreement. So I I could foresee someone taking litigation posturing Hmm. in challenging what the crypto is in the event of a litigation of a preference. And that also bears into mind, if it's security, it could have ramifications and consequences. Goes back to the fourth question that we talked about. Right. If the currency, it also could have ramifications down the road. In fact, this also leads a big question going back to the bankruptcy in the first day, which is could have Celsius and Voyager even file bankruptcy? That's a big question, especially when we talk about with uh, SIPA and broker dealers. So so let's talk a, lot, a little bit about that. So it's important to understand the bankruptcy code identifies who can be a debtor, who can file for bankruptcy. Right. And there are certain entities who are, uh, you know, who can either file a particular type of bankruptcy or cannot even file for bankruptcy at all. Hmm. So you mentioned SIPA. That's the Securities Investors Protection Act. If you're a broker dealer in, in the typical stock market, et cetera, broker dealer. Right. Uh, you have under SIPA, you would be regulated under SIPA. Mm-hmm. You have an ability to wind down under the statute, or if you choose to go to bankruptcy, you're limited to do a liquidation, you know, a stock broker bankruptcy. Right. If, for example, the type of operations that Celsius and Voyager had was a commodity bro- broker. They say that crypto is a commodity. This is a commodity broker. Then under the bankruptcy code, you could only liquidate as a commodity broker. That's in section six, 761 onward. Okay. Uh, so this, if it's a bank, that's another question. Bankruptcy code does not allow banks to go into bankruptcy. There are other <laughs> mechanisms. So if, if you start looking at the building blocks, okay, so I transferred my wallet into Celsius. I started earning rewards. Is that interest to my deposit? I started taking a loan against it. Is that just a general loan? Uh, it's It starts raising questions if it quacks like a bank, but walks like a stockbroker, what is it? <laughs> what is it? That's the big question. And that, that's where the, this really will come down to what the judge decides to how far this will go and what they define it as. It Correct. seems like, and remember everybody, so we're just going through one page of this uh, first day. Imagine how much documentation that these everybody has to go through. This is a complex, more, way more complex than, than what I gave it credit for. Okay. So we broke those things down. And you want to thank you so much. That makes a lot more sense. A lot of things to consider. Let's go into, I think, what, what people are really wondering, which is this. What makes a Chapter 11 successful in your experience? And you've had you know, years and years of experience doing this. So how do people get to a resolution? Is it all just, okay, chapter 11, and then all, all the businesses just go away, they all get liquidated, or is there a way through? So I, I've been doing bankruptcy for 15 plus years, yeah. been involved in a lot of chapter 11s. Like I mentioned, the latest case that I've been involved is the largest bankruptcy in the history of the United States, which is a municipal bankruptcy of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico mm-hmm. under a special statute that is similar to chapter nine you start seeing after so many years particular trends chapter 9 operates similarly to to a certain degree to chapter 11 and in the other chapter 11s as well but let me break down the basics of it okay you have a plan to pay the debt and you group creditors in classes so what makes a chapter 11 successful the chapter 11 case that is has the ability to reach more consensus than less consensus One of the things that I mentioned, I want to highlight in chapter 11, after you group the creditors into classes, each class prior to confirmation needs to vote on the plan. So they either accept or they reject the plan. If you're able to get 100 percent acceptance, you still need to go through some legal requirements that that the court has to look into. But it makes the case, quote unquote, easier because you start seeing a trend of everyone moving towards confirmation. 
So what typically happens in these particular cases, there's, there might be some litigation. You probably, it's very rare that you see a chapter 11 case that it's all or nothing litigation, that is resolved mm -hmm. exclusively on litigation, that it's not practical. So at the end of the day, you litigate to reach resolution. So you might litigate some points, you might win some, lose some, or settle some. Right. But at some point, you start getting momentum on settlements. To the extent you're able to reach more settlements quicker and faster with more groups, that is usually a good indica statistically that you have a higher percentage rate of success in the chapter 11. Doesn't it. mean it's absolute because at the end of the day, if the plan, for example, is illegal, violates the bankruptcy code completely, mm -hmm. the judge is going to be hamstrung, is not going to be able to, to confirm it. But gotcha. assuming it passes muster and you're able to garner that support quicker, faster, and easier with more people, that increases your likelihood of success. I don't, I, I believe that this case is, will operate under the same dynamics. Gotcha. Yeah. And the case that you're working on now, uh, this is for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. How many years has this been going on? And so you guys are just case, getting now? That case was filed in May 3, 2017. Mm -hmm. The case was finally confirmed on January 16, 2022. Mm. And we're talking about huge amounts of litigation that ensued. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, the building blocks were there. Consensus started to get reached with different group of creditors. And you started seeing a momentum. Gotcha. I can kind of on, on on some of these on some of these days I can feel I can see that there's there's some kind of momentum going on, but then there, there's always like a little roadblock. So hopefully this catches acceleration and we can move forward. But that makes a lot of sense. Consensus, everybody votes on it, moves forward. You're never going to win 100. percent You're going to have to give and take, and then off you go. Hopefully we can make some of these investors or. Celsius and Voyager can make these investors whole. That's not our job, though. It's just our job. No, to no. And, and yeah. as the saying goes, it's better to have a bad deal than a good litigation sometimes. <laughs> uh, so I'll take that, it. that's that's a maxim some lawyers operate off. Yeah, I can, I can see that. So that so that answers a, a big chunk of that. Now let's just go to the last part, which I think is is what I'm always preaching on this on this show. It's not very popular, but I do believe we need regulation to move forward, especially just to get out of the the, the conundrums of, 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 of the downfalls and pitfalls of what crypto can be and should be. And I think that we just need a little bit of just not stifling regulation. But the question is, how does this case transfer to general crypto regulation? Because the judge has to make a lot of decisions. And will this set precedent? And how can this move forward? What do you, what do you say here? So it's going to be very interesting here. So the way yeah. I see it, crypto is getting to that point of our relationship where someone needs to stand up and ask, what are we? Where are we going? What's happening here? Mm -hmm. uh, this is not uncommon. For example, the dot-com, uh, you know, the bubble that happened at, at one point mm -hmm. faced that similar question and had a watershed moment. And did that mean that the internet went, went away? No, it didn't. Uh, but there were a, a set of rules and an understanding of how things would move forward afterwards. So we're talking about after the bubble burst in the 90s. So I don't know if we're there yet, but I can definitely tell you that just looking at the legal questions that Celsius posted itself, many of them will require a hard conversation, either a resolution by the court or a hard conversation moving forward. Let's start with the first thing. What is Celsius? What is Voyager? Are these platforms banks? Are they broker dealers? Are they commodity brokers? Do they need to be regulated by SIPA or not? In right. fact, the judge in Voyager flagged that they had a concern on whether Voyager even filed the correct bankruptcy. It, it seemed to imply that they were looking at Voyager as a broker dealer. And if right. that's the case, it would have to go through a Chapter 7 liquidation under 741 at SEC, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about hypotheticals. These questions are actually being posed. And then that brings us to another subset of questions. After you identify what type of relationship are we, but the typical, what are we here? Mm -hmm. The next question is, you know, how does this work? It, it goes back to, is crypto currency? Is crypto stock? Is crypto commodities, general intangible, bailments, you name it? 
the, right. the, diff- the different type of situations on how you define this type of asset in the bankruptcy, right? And depending on how that, so the first thing is if those questions are posed and answered, depending on the answer, you'll start seeing parties who need to take action. So if, if a bankruptcy judge were to be inclined to believe this is a stock, that'll generate pressure on the SEC to start to look into it. Mm. Same question. If they believe this is a broker dealer, the SEC will be pressured into having to look into this. Uh, also, and whether it needs to be under SIPA, et cetera. Uh, uh, other questions that arise is who is the owner here yeah. of this going forward? Can we trust these type of platforms going forward? If there's a determination that you op- use these platforms and you lose all your ownership rights on the crypto and it becomes the debtors in the event of a bankruptcy, will you ever trust a platform like that going forward? Do we even need a particular regulator for these type of a marketplace? These are all the things and see like like these things like the, the last thing you just talked about. First of all, thanks for that, that concise answer. The question then, then becomes... Well, will anybody ever trust these type of platforms, these earn platforms? And then we had talked about this before, and I said, I don't think anybody is going to. However, I just remembered there was this hack in 2014 for Mt. Gox. And after Mt. Gox, the, the, hap, uh, the hack, nobody tr- trusted exchanges. And now fast forward eight years later, actually just a couple years later after that, look what happened. Exchanges are abound. Everything grows. And there's just more and more around there. So the optics... Just the optics of it, I think people's memories are very short, unfortunately. I mean, not for my subscribers. They're all very, very genius smart. But it's, it's, uh, it's important to, to recognize these problems that are going forth. So well, that's concerning, but I can understand why. If the SEC and the CFTC is going to have to come down and say, well, what is this? Is this a security? Is this a commodity? The OCC, is this a currency? Then go from there. But I can understand now why these cases uh, are bigger than what we are uh, what we may have believed in the beginning. So, Ajuan, you answered them all to to uh, uh, to my delight, and I appreciate you coming by. I really do. Any last last things? Any comments that we uh, maybe have missed? We've covered a lot of information in a short amount of time. I believe we we have covered a lot of information <laughs> in a short amount of time. Uh, honestly, I believe we're going into uncharted territories. This is. Crypto is trying to get into a point where the rubber beats a road. It's becoming more mature. Uh, It's definitely become a big investment, has an impact in the economy. I I want your viewers to understand that back in 2008, when the economy fell and the subprime lending, you know, there was some sort of regulation, but -hmm. it was not heavily observed and followed as it currently is. In fact, when that market crashed, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was created. So bear in mind, I don't know if we're at a juncture where there's a big enough crisis that, you know, heavy handed regulation needs to be taken in or the government needs to step in. But going to exactly what you mentioned, with what, what happened in Mount Gox, there was the theft with the, uh, with the blockchain recently by these two individuals that was uh, investigated by the Justice Department. Now we have to, these two bankruptcies. We're starting to see a lot of very important and benchmark questions on the marketplace and on cryptos that are starting to be raised, and they start creating little crises. Right. So the question is, is if we're at a tipping point on those little crises that need this needs to be taken a look into. But what I would just generally say is, uh, you know, uh, it's happening. The questions are there. They have to be posed. And unless everyone is able to reach a complete, absolute consensus in this case, and we avoid the questions altogether, some hard answers need to be brought in, and those will have repercussions down the road. So I, I'm, act, I'm I for one, I'm actually looking forward to seeing how this develops. I do not want to be the sitting judge in any of these cases to have to answer these questions, but it's nonetheless very, very interesting. Yeah, it's interesting for for you, the Justice Department, for Gary Gensler of the SEC, for the CFTC, and more importantly, the people that had uh, trusted these two platforms to move forward. So, Juan, I want to say thanks again for stopping by. If you have time later on, I'll we'll have you back on again. We can talk about it. But I know you're a busy guy. But I want to say again, thanks. Thank you. All right, everybody. So let's jump back. 
All right, so that was pretty comprehensive. And I wanna say again, thank you, Najuan, for coming by and just answering all these questions that can kind of give us a little more clarity. Now, I know there's a longer road to go, but at least we know uh, exactly uh, the stipulations and the different parts of this chapter 11 and we can move forward. So if you liked today's video, and it was a little bit long, you give me a thumbs up, that'd be great. Also consider subscribing. A lot of things we talk about are very time sensitive, especially these types of instances. So thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.